Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Um, we've been commenting for a couple of weeks now about how what a crappy climate it is for people who have new books out um, amidst um, a breaking news thing. Um, and you know, uh, Greg Liganov had his new, has his new book out, and. Um, Next week, we already recorded it. You'll hear my conversation with uh, Mike Rothschild, author of Jewish Space Lasers. Um, and we've had a few other authors. And uh, and this one is a particular challenge because uh, my friend Dan Senor has a new book out. And I'm going to break some news here, um, which I don't know if Dan realizes. He has a new book out with co-author Saul Singer, The Genius of Israel, The Surprising Resilience of a Divided Nation in a Turbulent World. And on the one hand, it's like perfectly on point for the things that we're talking about today and also just frustratingly premature because obviously it couldn't take into account a surprise attack that happened basically when the book came out. Um, but the news I wanted to break, and then I'll bring Dan in here, is I'm looking at the Amazon page for The Genius of Israel. Um, and it is the number one bestseller in engineering patents and inventions. So there you go, Dan, I had no idea you, uh, uh, were laying out such thorough work on IP in, uh, the, I, I have <laughs> no idea Israel. why that is other than our last book, startup nation was so focused on the tech world and the tech ecosystem and i think a lot of engineering patent and tech types were into it and so they yeah. were buying that book and the amazon algorithm may just lump us maybe in with that crowd i don't know but but it's exciting it's very exciting I, i'm sure a lot oh. of the listeners of the remnant are are patent lawyers and you know engineering phds and so this is this is fortuitous yeah although i i, I think you know, and I don't, I don't hand out compliments glibly or lightly. I think even if you were not an IP lawyer or a mechanical engineer PhD, you should probably get uh, the genius of Israel. Like it's not just for mechanical right. engineers You're right. You're right. And, uh, and IP lawyers. It's not even probably for right. either of those. I of we didn't even have them in mind when we wrote the book. Um, yeah, like, but, but we're if, always happy if, to find a new audience. That's right. Yeah. That's right. If you have, if, if you had an editor who says, "Okay, I want you to think about your target audience here." Yeah, it's an IP lawyer. <laughs> we are. We, <laughs> listens- Jonah. We are. You know, it's like in politics, we're broadening the base, we're expanding the coalition. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, and by the like, way, we, we 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 Jews these days need to need to we need friends wherever we can find them. So that's you, true. So yeah. if this if this is this is who we can count on, better them than the you know most of the elite college administrations these days. So, um, um, I always ask book authors when they're on to talk about their books. My first question is always, what's your book about? So what's your book about? It's about how Israel has built the, uh, most upbeat, happy. Yes. Happy. The UN ranks Israel as the fourth happiest country in the world, which we can talk about, uh, optimistic, self-confident, uh, community oriented, uh, society. We believe it, probably in the world, but at least the among wealthy, affluent, you know, what Western democracies and uh, sort of surprising because w- as we stumbled into into this, the set of social science, we you wouldn't think a country like Israel surrounded by enemies, as we have really seen over the last month uh, in a in a constant state of crisis. And uh, lots of external threats, a lot of domestic tension. Uh, Israel's not an easy place to live, uh, high cost of living, a lot of stress. Uh, we were struck that it was ranked such a happy place. And then we, by its own citizens, and then we started to look at some of the other uh, social science data and found that on just about every metric, the West is heading in a really bad place from you know, crashing demography, people having fewer and fewer children, aging populations, plateauing life expectancy at best, crisis of deaths of despair, mental health, teen mental health, loneliness epidemic, a lot of these issues you've talked about uh, on your podcast. It just seems that the West is all heading in one direction and Israel's heading in the other. And we thought, wow, 
on every one of these metrics, Israel's doing better than everyone else. Why? Why? Why, when the when the West is is aging and shrinking populations, Israel is young and growing? Why in the West there's a loneliness epidemic and a teen mental health crisis? And as as the CDC told us a few months before we went to press with the book, that there's a phrase I never thought I would hear as the father of teenage boys. Uh, there is a teen suicide epidemic. So the number, this is now, this predates the pandemic. The number of suicides or attempted suicides among teens is on the rise. Uh, Israel has the lowest teen suicide rate in the OECD. It doesn't, it doesn't have a loneliness crisis. Um, I, I can go on and on and on. So we were, we were wondering why this is like, what has Israel done differently? And is there anything the West can learn from Israel? And Part of what we were writing about was the sense of community and solidarity in the country and how Israel actually organizes itself to make people feel connected, give them a sense of belonging, give them a connection to country and the national project, uh, give them a sense of optimism, even when there's so much doom around them. And we wanted to write this book during this 2023, we wanted to publish it because everyone was pretty down on Israel given the domestic disputes and they were saying, oh my gosh, the country's tearing itself apart and it's it's a, it's a cold civil war going on in the country over judicial reform. And we were arguing that Israel may get really divisive as it has at many points in its history, but it won't spin apart. And the reason it won't actually split apart is because it has these, these societal shock absorbers built into the country that, the, that we in the US can learn from. And so that's why we wrote the book to say political polarization doesn't have to ruin your country. It hasn't ruined Israel's. Let us tell you why. And then October 7th. And then the war happened. And we can talk about that. But but that was the that's why we want to write the book. Yeah, so it's 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 interesting. I mean, just two thoughts come to mind. Um one is I've been I've been interested in this phenomenon about is Israeli social capital. Um for a while and i've mentioned it a few times on here about how in sebastian younger's book tribe uh he makes this point he doesn't really dwell on it for very long but he makes this really fascinating point that israeli soldiers have much much lower you know orders of magnitude lower if we can have an order of magnitude lower um amounts of ptsd and the argument is, is that first of all in a country where most people have served um and everyone knows why you're serving and you know that you're serving when you're in the military like you're doing it for the people at home in a much more or you know like tangible way that people feel and the ex and the experience the disconnect between you know kandahar for an american who then goes back to cleveland versus a guy who goes from you know uh duking it out with hezbollah or Hamas, and then back to Tel Aviv, you don't feel like you're coming back into a different world. Everyone kind of understands where you've been. A lot of them have shared the experience. And what's inter just, what's interesting to me about it is that PTSD, there's a component of PTSD that is not about actually the horrors of what you saw. It's about the readjustment into normal civil society that is causes the stress, right? right. It's that disconnect between the two. And then the other thing is we just I just had uh, David Brooks on here yesterday talking about his book, another book that, you know, runs into the teeth of the Israel stuff. Um, and a big part of his his argument is that and this also ties in with um, Russ Roberts's book, right, is that on the individual basis, you need to you need to have something to live for. Right. You need a purpose. You need something that is other directed outside of yourself um to give you a reason to get out of bed right and your book kind of makes the case that that's um that's scalable to societies as well there's a reason why israel as a country has to get out of bed in a way that it's not the same for a lot of other countries and that sense of purpose and collective meaning i think probably explains a huge part of, of what you're talking about in the book yeah so i would it's it so it's interesting that you mentioned sebastian younger we spoke to him quite a bit for our book uh, he had a big influence on 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 how we thought about it because it's often helpful. I mean, Saul and I are so steeped in Israel. I mean, he literally lives there, and and I spend a lot of time there, and I have a lot of family there, and I'm 
very involved with Israel. So we're, we're so in it. And Sebastian has no stake in Israel. He's no, so it's almost interesting when you have someone who's a complete outsider just making that observation. And that struck with us. We open the book, the, first, the introduction, with a quote from Sebastian Younger, where he says, I'm just going to quote from him because I think it's on point with what you're referring to. He says, humans don't mind hardship. In fact, they thrive on it. What they mind is not feeling necessary. Modern society has perfected the art of making people f- not feel necessary. And I think that gets to what you're saying is that is that the sense that we've made life very easy for everyone here in the United States, right? You got your Amazon account, you got your Netflix account, you got your DoorDash account, you got your, I mean, you just press a button and you, you really can, you know, you can, many people can, can, can work virtually now as, as we saw during COVID and some of that has continued. It's just, so it's all wonderful. It's all very convenient. But what's your purpose? Like, what's your role? What, 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 what how, how are you necessary? And, and I, if we didn't call the book The Genius of Israel, maybe the better title would have been Necessary Nation. Because it's a country where everybody feels necessary. They feel like they have a role. And, I, and, it, and it's, it's not only healthy for, as you said, there's all this social science we, we refer to in the, in the book that just points to, and medical science, um, that points to the, the, the need to have a sense of purpose, the need to have, the, in terms of for your physical health, not just your mental health, for your physical health, to feel like you're, you're, you're waking up in the morning to do something, to advance something. And the other, the other person, another person we quote extensively in the book, who's a, who's a close friend, and I just think the world of him, is a guy named Mika Goodman, who's a public intellectual in Israel. He's he has the Hebrew language number one downloaded podcast in in Israel uh, in any category. He's written extensive books explaining, you know, complicated biblical texts to a secular audience. He's a really interesting, thoughtful guy, and he he made this point to saw me. He said, "What you need to understand is Israel is a small country with a big story." Now, what does it mean to be a small country with a big story? He says there are plenty of small countries. This was not the only small country in the world, right? You go to many European countries comparable in size to Israel's population or countries a little bigger, say like Canada. They're, 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 they're wonderful countries, but what's their actual purpose? What's their story? It's about improving the quality of life for their citizens, increasing the standard of living, make sure government services work well. You know, Estonia, much smaller country than Israel, you know, is very proud of its 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 system for e-voting and e-filing of taxes and e-this and e-that. And so that's what their story is. He says, Israel is a small country with a really big story, so disproportionate to its size. Now, there are there are big countries with big stories. The United States is a country with a big story. China's a big country with a big story. But he says what's unique about Israel, it's just such a small country that has such a big story, a story of biblical proportions, you know, going back 2,000 years and God willing, go forward at least another 2,000 years. And so what matters in the country really matters. Like it really matters to the people living there. And it really matters in the world, like the issues, they're not arguing over tax reform in Israel. Right. They're arguing on big issues. Who is a Jew? Who should serve in the army? How does Israel have defensible borders with its neighbors when some of them have genocidal ambitions on them? How do you, uh, how do you have, do you have a constitution uh, when, when you can't reconcile so many of these issues around balance between uh, uh, religion and state and other issues? How do you, I mean, these are, Big, big issues. And so it's like a small country that's wrestling with big stuff. But because it's small, everyone has a role. Everyone in the country feels, as as Mika says, that you can touch history. That's his word. He says you can touch history. You can have a role. You can touch it. You can shape it. So if you're even if you're a person in a big country with a big story, the country may be so big, you feel like, well, what's my what can I do? What's my role? How can I have an impact? In Israel, and I think we're seeing it now, especially post October seventh, everybody in the country feels that they got a role here, and they and they can shape this moment, and they can shape history. And I think that is so incredibly powerful uh, and empowering, and it gives mm-hmm. people, as you said, it's, it's something to live for. It gives them a sense of belonging. It gives them a sense, and it gives them a sense of ownership. Um, so I want to return to that in a second, but it just it kind of reminds me. Um, 
one of my weird uh, obsessions is, uh, you know, at least ones I can disclose legally, um, <laughs> is uh, um, I love when I encounter moments where I have um, where figurative phrases are actually applicable literally. And like, so, uh, for example, me and some of my reprobate friends, um, used to go to the track a lot in Laurel and, and, um, one time we were looking at the next race and I asked my friend, Doug, I was like, who are you going to bet? Who are you betting on on the third race? And he says, I don't know. I kind of like so-and-so, but I got to look at their track record. And we both looked up at each other like, oh crap. You were using that literally. <laughs> and, um, and like I was on a boat recently and uh, and I go into the to talk to the captain about it. And and he's and I'm like, I know this isn't my wheelhouse. And I was like, no, nope, like literally this isn't my wheelhouse. You know, and like I, so like when I hear you talk about how. Israel has issues as a story of biblical proportions. The funny thing about it is it's literal. It's exactly. not figurative. Exactly. Right? You know, I mean, and that really comes through when you go to Israel. Yeah. And there are places, like I did this, the city of David tour, right? right? Which was really kind of blew me away. And like, it's one of these tours where, and I, I, I don't, I'm a very secular guy, right? But like, I can only imagine for, for people of deep faith, you know, Christian or otherwise, you're walking around and you say, so this is literally where the, I don't know, the Philistines snuck in from over here. Right? And like it's all very re it's all very literal and makes what for a lot of people are metaphorical stories about humanity, Athens and Jerusalem, all that kind of stuff. It brings it to life and makes you feel part of it in a really kind of fascinating way. I think that is the most powerful thing. Exactly. Uh, about visiting Israel, when you sit in certain parts of Jerusalem and you sit there thinking, particularly the old city, and you sit there thinking, so, so Jews here are speaking the same language in the same place, on, on in the same country, although this is the modern version of it, complying with the same rules and rituals that they did 3,000 years ago in this place, like right here, the same language, the same place, the same you know, religion and rituals and community. It, it's wild. And on the city of David, Ir David, I mean, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable project, but the, but what I'm always amused by, and it's both sort of jarring and inspiring and amusing is at the city of David, they'll find these little, you know, they're constantly doing these like digs, these archeological digs, and they find some artifact or some, they find some little like stone or, you know, and they say, Aha. And it's like 3000 years old or something. And they'll be like, you see, and this proves, and then they quickly tie it to some contemporary political debate, you know? So they're like, they've been there digging and they find this little, they find this little thing. They say, and therefore, and therefore, and they tell you the whole history of And therefore the debate happening today and the disagreement between the U S and Israel, da, da, right, da, da, right. Da, da, da. I don't think you get that anywhere else in the world. Um, why don't you just for listeners who don't, no, I mean, I can do it quickly if you want, but like to, you explain to people what the city of David is. Um, you probably know it better than I do. Yeah, basically it's a um, it's a, in the old city uh, where uh, where the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall is uh, where the, you know, the, the Alaska Mosque, the Dome of the Rock is the the where, where the second temple was is is the oldest um, history and recollection, you know, the old, oldest um uh, evidence of of Jewish biblical presence headquartered, you know, uh, the capital of in um, in Israel, and there's been a the city of David is a is a project that has been in the works. I don't know when it started. It was at least two or three decades ago. I could actually find out where they just started doing these very elaborate archaeological digs to climb under uh, these these biblical sites and, and under the, what was the second temple and basically find whole areas that refer to, or, or are consistent with um, the biblical version of events of, uh, of the Jewish presence there. And so it's like, it ain't, it ain't Disney world. It's real. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so, real. I mean, so the two takeaways I had from it and I did, I was there 10 years ago or more than that now, um, 15 years ago. Um, was one one of the things I love about it was 
that the old city of, of Jerusalem is actually the new city of Jerusalem, but it was started like 7,000 years ago. Right. <laughs> you know? It's like, there's a, there's right. actually an older one and that's what the city David sort of is. Right. And, and the other thing, which I did not know, and maybe the, I, I feel like I would have heard <coughs> if this has changed, but one of the ancillary, like there's some political things about it that get really controversial, but one of the, the, one of the things I did not know until I was there was that there is basically no contemporaneous evidence other than biblical accounts and that kind of thing that David was an actual historical figure. It's sort of like Robin Hood or King Arthur. Right. We're pretty sure they had to have exist. Well, maybe not Robin Hood, but like someone existed to make people think that they existed. Right. I mean, right. it's not like. Right. Um, and so what they're and they're getting really close because they're finding like they when I was there, they had recently found a coin that was minted like 15 years after David's yeah. death and it had David's image on it or something right. like that. Yeah. And um, it doesn't really matter for any of these larger political arguments, whether David was real or not. I mean, it does, but it does matter for all sorts of theological and historical and archaeological things. And um, and we are now up against the precipice of my knowledge about all of this stuff. Well, I and, would add one other point. The, the, yeah. I, I, everything you, you say is true, but weirdly, and I think less so now, but basically up until five or 10 years ago, there was a real push to challenge the Jew Jewish presence in modern day Israel going back thousands of years. So the, 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 the argument that, that the Jews in modern day Israel are colonialists only kind of works and it still doesn't, but only kind of works is if you say the Jews had nowhere to go, right? As the criticism would, the, the, the version of events would go, the Jews had nowhere to go. They were, they were chased out of Europe. They were chased out of countries elsewhere in the Middle East, in North Africa, you know, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, Jews had nowhere to go. So, and obviously Eastern Europe. And so they all descended upon this strip of land in Palestine, in, in pre-state Palestine, British mandated Palestine. And they built a state there, but they have no real history there. And the Palestinian Arabs, the Palestinian Muslim Arabs do have a history there. So we, we, the, the international community are very sorry uh, for the pain and suffering that Israel, that the Jews have been through, but why, why this strip of land, you know, didn't Herzl c consider Uganda as a, as a Jewish state? Like, why does it have to be here? You can, you can go anywhere and why go here and where it's, where, where the debates are so divisive and, um, and, and some people are going to have to get displaced as a result of, of the Jewish presence here. Why, why here? And of course the counter to that is why here? Cause the Jews were always here. Some Jews may have left, but there has always been, and at some point, Jews left for long stretches of time. But Jews have a claim on this land, and they were there for, you know, going back thousands of years. And so, if anything, it's just a return. And, but that was a debate. That was a debate between Israel and the international community and folk organs within the UN and UNESCO and, and the Palestinian leadership. So, part of the importance of City of David is to do what you just explained, which is really start to, to find these artifacts that make it sort of unavoidable uh, in terms of um, the, the Jewish presence there. It's not the only way to uh, address that, that criticism of Jewish presence, or the colonial argument, but it is, it is an important one. Okay, I want to get to the post-colonial, I mean, the colonial settler stuff and all that and the contemporary problems with Israel, but, um, and as much as I, I, I despise with a deep and abiding passion the people who say you have to understand the context um, <laughs> because of what what they mean by it. Um, uh, I do think it's sort of helpful for a lot of people to hear broader context about Israel rather than just the the Hamas is killing babies stuff. Even though people need to be reminded of that and shown that it's true and real. Um, and but I, so I want to go back to this point about um, the sort of the social capital living. Uh, for purposes, l causes larger than yourself and, and all that. So I'm a big fan of being dedicated to causes larger than yourself. I am a big opponent to, historically of politicians talking about how we need to be uh, committed to causes larger than ourselves. Because whenever politicians in America at least say it, 
what they mean is, and therefore you need to agree with my government program. And, um, and that it's this sort of, uh, you know, it, there's, there, there are Republican versions of this thing. You know, McCain had a lot of it and there are a lot of democratic versions of it where like government is the one thing we all, it's just the word for the thing we all do together. And it's really not what government is. Um, and, um, uh, and so one of the things I like about your argument about, about Israel is, and I, I, I don't want to get too deep into the, the political science on this, but I think there's a well-established finding that the Israeli system of government is fakakta. Yeah, that's and, a technical term, but yeah. Yeah, and, um, and so I have nothing but love for um, – well, I shouldn't say nothing but love because there can be dark versions of this too. But like I have nothing but love with positive or benign – um, expressions of social solidarity that don't use government to enforce them, right? And um, my big problem with the so-called nationalists on the American right today is that really it boils, it, there's no limiting principle to it, and it basically boils down to just giving more power to the federal government to impose our side's arguments on people who disagree with them. And that's not what I think America is supposed to be about. So anyway, the the reason why the Israel... Israeli nationalism bothers me left. And I'm not talking about the crazy settler types and the crazy, you know, and some of the other crazies. I just mean the, the stuff that you're, the social solidarity stuff that you're talking about is that it's not a government program, right? It is a bottom up, not a top down thing. To totally. So, yeah, I, I would say um, politics and government are the, to me, the least interesting part of what we write about. And it's the least relevant part to our thesis. Israel, you know, Michael Oren recently said to me, which I thought was really stuck with me. He said it after we wrote our book, but but it was in reference to our book. He said, you know, the United States has strong institutions, but a weak society. And Israel has weak institutions, but a strong society. And I, I think there's something to that. The government is, as you said, for cocked. It is, um, it is badly designed. It is hopelessly uh, incompetent and really not relevant at all to the issues we write about in our book. What, what brings the society together where you see this solidarity uh, is, and I'll just give a few examples. Uh, one, the culture of the, of the, of the way children are raised in Israel at every stage of their life is, is about, your responsibilities as being part of a community. It's not only about individual success and individual excellence. And don't get me wrong, Israelis are very, you know, focused on their own individual excellence too. I mean, look at the success of the startup tech sector. You you know, people have become fabulously wealthy in Israel individually. So it's, it's not that they're not um, focused on the individual at all. It's just that there's a balance and you see it in, in the way the schools are run um, there's what's in vogue here in the United States right now is personalized learning. I want personalized learning. I want individual learning. I want to, I want everything to be catered around my child and, and, and as though the experience of the child, the child has in school is completely divorced with the experience of being with other children and learning to be part of a group in a community. Whereas in Israel, there was a revolt among parents against personalized learning because there's a word in, in Hebrew called gibush, gibush, which we write about is it's about the experience you get from being part of a family of friends and a and a and a friend group and a and a community, and that schools were learning the sen losing the sense of gibush with all this push for individ individualized learning. So the focus is on the team, the group. Then later, a little older, the kids scouting. The scouts movement is a huge deal in Israel. Most young, certainly non ultra orthodox. Uh, uh, Jews in Israel are part of the scouting movement. Also, it's it's youth run. It, the participation routes, uh, rates are off the charts. Also, same culture of being part of a community. Then you have either the pre or post army gap years, these programs called Mechinot, which are have a similar dynamic, but for older kids. And then finally, obviously, the army, which is a an experience that people have with, um, you know, other people their age, males for three years, females for two years at formative age stage in their life. And, and unless they go on and for officers training school or they're one of the elite units, which could be longer, but then they're in their reserves, you know, they have reserve duty and reserve duty goes on till they're about their forties and they get together with the same unit 
that they were served with in their 1890. So I have friends who are in their 30s who are still meeting with their unit and doing reserve duty a couple of weeks a year, every year. And so it maintains these bonds. And so at every step of the way, it's it's about learning how to be part. That is what it means to be something larger than yourself. It's not all about you. So you so so the incentive system, when you watch, you talk to people in the IDF, how they do their, um, how they evaluate people who want to get into the most elite units, the Air Force or one of the elite tech units like 8200 or 9900. Um, they say, look, you can, you can be a huge brain. You can be a huge talent. We evaluate for that, right? We look at all how these kids did in high school, and, but they take all these tests. But if they don't, if they have zero EQ, like if they can't mm-hmm. work with others, they're not going to make it. Because obviously you can't yeah. be in a military unit if you can't work with others. doesn't matter how, right. how good you are. So I mean, the, we'll f- you'll find a use for them, but not in that unit. Right. right? I mean, and the incentive yeah. system, therefore, at every stage of life, is learning how that's what it means to think of something larger. Like the, you're part of a yeah. community. It's not all about you. And I, Jonathan Sachs, uh, Rabbi John, the late Jonathan Sachs, who's the chief rabbi of the UK, uh, you know, huge, huge influence on on my thinking and Saul's thinking. And I think a lot of people in the Jewish world that, that you and I, you and I know, he um, once interviewed Paul Johnson, the historian. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Paul Johnson wrote all these very, important histories of you know yeah like he, paul john's a huge influential guy in my life so. right right okay so, so i don't need to right so he wrote the history of the jewish people and um and so jonathan Sachs tells this story he says i was interviewing paul johnson and i said you've done all these histories of all these different people from around the world so when you compare your book the history of the jewish people to all the other books you've written what what's what's the one thing that stands out in your mind you you know you, the book is like seven or eight hundred words i encourage people to read it or at least dip in and out of it but uh but if you but but it's a big book and so if you had to pick one thing in the book he says to paul johnson and paul johnson says um he says look if you look around the world in every community i've ever studied he said most societies are usually very collectivist some societies are very collectivist like obviously many societies in the East. And and then you kind of swing pretty aggressively all the way to the other end, and they're very individualistic, like many societies on the West. You, It's usually pretty stark. You usually don't find a lot of middle ground between those two extremes. He says, the Jewish people and later Israel, the modern state of Israel, is the only example I can think of, Johnson says, that actually has both. It strikes this balance between a commitment to the individual and individual ambition and respect for individual ambition to succeed and be excellent with like a balance between that with a sense of being part of something larger than themselves and, and being part of a community. And I think Johnson actually nails it on Israel, that that's, that's what's going on. So where this really hit Solomon was we wrote this book, Startup Nation, you know, over a decade ago, and it was all about the dazzling tech community, which we argued was the Israel's tech community was the most important innovation economy outside of Silicon Valley in the world. And years later, we went back to check in with a lot of the entrepreneurs we wrote about and some new entrepreneurs. And I deal with some of these folks in my in my business life. And um, and we press them because they're, they're – the risks that these entrepreneurs are taking are bigger and bigger and they're, they're building bigger and bigger companies and they're doing bigger and bigger things. And, uh, and so we asked them, so why, like, how do you, how do you make these decisions, risk management, how do you take these risks? And it's, we kept hearing over and over versions of, and not exactly articulated this way, but in so many words, a sense that they don't feel alone when they're taking these big risks. They feel that, the country, not when we think of the country like the government has their back, not the government. It's not, you know, it's it's not, you know, Obama's old line, you know, you didn't build that, you know, it's not it's not like some government program did this for you. They, they meant like they felt that the community of the country was like rooting for them. There's not resentment really of the of the tech of tech success in Israel. There there's pride. There's a sense that these entrepreneurs are putting Israel on the map globally. And and so there, there's a country that there's a sense that like yeah, you take risks, things could go sideways, your whole your whole startup could blow up. It's not career suicide. You'll go start something again. 
you know, you're not you're not going to be stigmatized for the rest of your of your career. The country has your back. And so that's powerful. That sense that, yeah, I want to crush it. I want to go build some startup. I want to go do great things. I want to make a lot of money. And yet I feel that I'm part of something here and I'm rooted here and I'm and 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 I'm and I'm part of a national project. I know that sounds a little eerie to talk about a national project. Because that does start sounding like some of like McCain's stuff that I know makes you made you cringe a bit. But again, I I think that blend is powerful in Israel, and it explains um, why people are sort of upbeat and feel a sense of belonging and feel that they're they they are are committed to something bigger than than just you know crushing it on their you know SATs and then getting into a good college. So. Um... For people who don't know Israel, and I don't know Israel, well. I've only been there once. And you and, were sick, um, and you got sick when you were there. No, no, worse. Uh, my brother had a terrible. Accident oh my god, I'm sorry. Home. Okay, okay. So, um, um, but uh, um, the explain how all how sort of just do a sort of Israel one on one explainer on this, and then explain to me how it fits in with your larger thesis, what is the deal with the ultra Orthodox in Israel, right? Like they don't have to serve in the military. I, the, the Israelis I know, I, I will say, I don't think I can charge them with anti-Semitism, but not all of them are really in love with the <laughs> ultra Orthodox. A few of them call them the black hats. Um, and, uh, you, the, Western, the the average Joe conception of Israel is this country where military service is mandatory and all the Israelis want to fight to preserve their nation and they feel besieged and all this kind of stuff. And then they find out that, oh, but there's this sizable and growing community of people who are basically right wing religious people on welfare. That's I'm not that's not my argument. I'm just that's what that's the way it's characterized. You're exactly right. And so. uh how does this fit in? Is this sustainable? Yeah. Um, you know, the, their birth rates are very high. Um, I am all in favor. Like, I, I'm all in favor of religious minorities, even religious minorities within religious minorities, letting their own flag fly and doing what they 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 feel like they have to do. But like, it feels like there's a tension there that is not sustainable over the long haul. You're okay. So, all right, I'll I'll. Uh there's a lot in in there that I'll that I'll um I'll do my best to unpack but if I'm not doing it uh if I'm not doing it well you'll 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 tell me um so it's a it's a small but growing uh minority uh in the pop uh in Israel it's you know depending on how you calculate you know you know 10 12% maybe a little more of, of the population uh it used to be a tiny population in Israel when the state was founded uh it was a few hundred families and David Ben Gurion, the Israel's George Washington, the, the founding prime minister of of Israel, uh, basically who was who was very secular, some would say radically secular, uh, knew that in order to build legitimacy for the modern state of Israel in the Jewish world, and have all segments of the Jewish community uh, bought into it, that he needed the ultra orthodox to 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 bless it, so to speak, to be, to be committed. And so, um, and, and these were leaders from who were at the, you know, were coming largely from Eastern Europe. Uh, and they were what they, the ultra Orthodox, or it's called in Hebrew, the Haredim, the, the Haredi uh, community, uh, did not want to serve in the army, uh, because they wanted to study. Uh, they wanted their best scholars to study all day and not, so if you're going to have compulsory military service, uh, everyone has to serve, no matter what other talents they have. Uh, they felt that the best scholars in in the ultra orthodox community should should study and not study, not serve in the army or work for that matter. And that was the true. That was the case in Eastern Europe before um, before World War II. So Ben Gurion agreed to this deal. He agreed to allowing a a, a unwritten exemption for this community, which was fine. The problem was, from the perspective of many Israelis, is that the community grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until the now where it represents a substantial uh, percentage of Israel's population. 
And it's one thing for some rule or some exemption to apply to a few hundred families. It's something entirely different for it to apply to, you know, uh, uh, a large segment of the population. What does it mean when all these people aren't serving the army and aren't working, or as you say, are on some sort of government support? Uh, and so this has been a big source of the tension in Israel in 2023, before October 7th, with the uh, debate over judicial reform. And um, and there were a number of fault lines that were being debated and they were being, you know, that were expressing themselves uh, during the judicial reform debate. But one of them was resentment among non-religious Jews uh, towards this, this ultra-Orthodox community, given how large it had gotten, given that they didn't serve in the army and given how much power they had in Israel's Knesset. They became kingmakers in Israeli politics and they certainly were instrumental in Netanyahu forming this government. And we should just say for people to understand, when you say non-religious Jews, sometimes you mean actually non-religious Jews. And sometimes you just mean Jews who observe all the holidays <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But by comparison to these guys who study Torah 24-7, yeah. 365, they're not religious. But they're, in fact, religious by like normal American standards. They're just... Yeah. They also have day jobs and yeah. they join the military. Yeah. Well, right? I would say some of them actually, ironically, are very religious. They're just not cut off from society. And to your point, they have day. So there's like, look, my sister and, and brother-in-law, Saul, who, who, you know, is the co-author of my book. I mean, they are what we call Shomer Shabbos. They shut down. Uh, I've never literally, I've never spoken to my sister ever on the phone on Shabbat or on a Jewish holiday in our entire lives. Like since we've lived in separate places, not once. That's how religious she is, except for one day, October seventh, was the only day she answered the phone. But, but you know, they 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 are they live they lead what we would call here in the United States a religious life. Uh, and there are many people like them, and um, and then even secular Jews. I mean, this is a little bit of a digression, but I think it's important. Even secular Jews in Israel lead a religious life, but they would never describe it as religious. So. Like if I if I say to someone, someone says, oh, the secular Israelis, right? Those secular Israelis. I say, okay, so so let's talk about those secular Israelis. If I said to you, I'm going to describe someone to you. Um, I'm going to describe a Jew to you. If I told you that Jew only speaks Hebrew, which is you and I were talking about earlier, is language with biblical roots. It's, bib it's a biblical language. So they only speak Hebrew. They, most of their friends and family, if not all of them, are Jewish. Uh, they live on a Jewish land in a Jewish country, and they live their lives based on a, on the Hebrew calendar, right? Right. They're they're literally the whole lives are structured based on the Shabbat every week and about the Jewish holidays. And um, is that person religious or not? And everyone everyone says, "Oh yeah, they're absolutely religious." I said, "I've just described most secular Israelis, right? They speak Hebrew. Their lives and communities, their friends or family are Jewish. They live in the state of Israel." And they live according to a Hebrew calendar. So, so yes, you're right. It's it's there very there are range. There's a whole range of religiosity in Israel. We're, we're you and I are talking about now is the extreme, this ultra orthodox community that is that leads. It's almost like its own tribe. They're not like part of. They're almost like not part of the state. So, this has been a source of tension. The tension bubbled up in 2023 during the um, during the judicial reform debate. Uh, I was starting to see cracks in that community's um, unwillingness to integrate in any way with the rest of Israeli society uh, over the last number of years. I think, I think post October 7th is going to be the biggest crack, which we can get to, but I've already, I'd already started to see the cracks. Uh, first of all, in my, in my world dealing with the tech community, with the high tech community, there were more and more, uh, people from the so Israeli uh, ultra orthodox men don't work; they tend to study in the yeshivas. But increasingly, the women work, mm -hmm. and um, and they work have worked in schools and what they call gans, which are like kindergartens. So they work in schools, or sometimes they work in kind of medical, uh, in you know facilities. And in, and there's such a there has been such a human capital shortage in the tech community in Israel. There's just not enough Israelis to service all the demand for all these Israeli tech startups and all these multinationals setting up in Israel. So increasingly, many of these tech companies are trying to hire these 
Haredi women, these ultra orthodox women, to work there. Mm-hmm. And the stories of how these secular, hyper secular, what we call hyper secular, Israeli mm-hmm. tech VCs and startups have like structured their workplaces to allow and enable um, these Haredi women to work there is, is pretty impressive. So then these women start working and they're actually making good money and doing interesting things. Mm-hmm. And so then you start to see more and more, again, it was quiet, but you start to see more and more Haredi men say, truth is, I'm not that great a scholar. Like, right. like the whole system was set up so that the best Jewish scholars would spend their time studying. The system, if you go back and look at Poland, you know, pre-World War II, it was never designed for every single ultra-Orthodox right. Jew to be studying all the time. It was for the best right. scholars. And they've built a system in Israel where it's not just the best scholars. It's, ev- it's the entire community. And many yeah. of these guys are like, I'm not that good a scholar. And my wife has a pretty cool job at a tech startup. And like, yeah. why can't I have a version of that? So we've already, over the last number of years, we've already started to see some of that. We write in the book about um, how the tech community, the secular tech community in Tel Aviv was reached out to by leaders in the ultra-Orthodox community from B'nai Barak. B'nai Barak is a Haredi town and they and near Tel Aviv. And the leaders of B'nai Barak reached out to some of the biggest names in the tech scene and said, look, there's a bunch of guys in this in our community, in the ultra orthodox community, who are com- who are writing business plans. Like they want, they have t- ideas, they have tech ideas. The whole startup scene is a craze in Israel, but we're not part of it. We want to be part of it. And these leaders in the tech community that we read about were like, "Are you kidding me? You guys are like going to have business plans and startups?" Long story short, they ultimately, which we described, they organized a business plan competition for the Haredi community, and the demand for it. They, they got like hundreds of uh, submissions of business plans. And then they had a ceremony where the top VCs in Israel evaluated the business plan, a more sophisticated, more elegant version of Shark Tank, say. And they got some space, some auditorium space. I think it was at Tel Aviv University, also a very secular place. And they announced that this thing was going to happen for the Haredi community. And when I we interviewed the people like Chemi Perez and Yossi Vardy and you know some of these other players in the in the tech community, the secular was a quote unquote secular tech community. They're like, we're thinking auditorium. We don't need an auditorium. None of these Haredi Jews are going to show up. Like who, who's going to attend this thing? They can't be part of this part of Israeli society. Com- there were thousands of them that showed up. It was completely overflow. So we started to see this interest in breaking out. And I think COVID was the next break because the key to the Haredi community uh, being walled off is cutting off all their communications with you know, modern media. They, most of them don't have smartphones. Um, they don't have TVs. If you if you if you have a TV, then you have to have the special antenna on the top of your apartment building, which is a dead giveaway that you have a TV, and then you get you know into trouble with the Haredi leaders. And so there's all these implications. So they were successfully walled off. COVID changed that a little bit because most of the information for how we all dealt with COVID. Uh, and most of the information we we're getting from the authorities was through our f- smartphones. So the Haredi leaders eased up with the smartphones. And so now once you ease that up, you can't reel it back in. So now Israelis, the Haredi have more and more access to information. They were already getting more and more interested in working in the non, or at least some of them in the non Haredi uh, yeshiva world. And then October 7th happens. And this is the most moving thing for me. I mean, as someone who I've always thought the tension with the Haredi community was worrisome, but not as catastrophic as some were projecting. And I don't think the population growth, and we lay out the population growth, the demographic growth in the Haredi community in our book, we lay out that it's not, some of the forecasts are really like the Haredi are going to take over the country. We don't believe that. We go through a bunch of the data to show that, that it's actually not very accurate. Uh, and there's a bunch of reasons why it actually may slow down. But be that as it may, the most amazing thing about October 7th, and it's hard to say anything amazing about October 7th because it was such a horror show. But what we have seen now is large numbers from the Haredi community inundating the IDF wanting to enlist in the army. Now, I don't want to overstate it. It's a, it's coming from a low base. So it's, it's, it's the surge is a surge, but it's off a low base, but it's real. And, um, and, and 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 so now these Haredi members of the Haredi community are like training, like a lot of them are training and wanting to serve, which tells me they feel a part of this country 
and not just a part of their own little sub community, that they're part of a country, not a tribe. And um, I, so I'm, we come out in this book cautiously optimistic that the, the dysfunction in the relationship between the Haredi community and the rest of the population is not as, um, is not, is not as problematic as, as we may think. So we're like all the business plans for Torah interpretation apps. <laughs> if you want, I will send you some of these business plans. There's a couple that are, there, there's now whole VC funds that, that yeah. uh, have been set up for this community. It's quite, it's quite impressive. How to find a Glock kosher place. No, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's, 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 it's wonderful. Um, all right. So we should, you know, I listen to you on pa, on the commentary and I've been yeah. listening to commentary and like, like I, I got up and I know you're, you're on the board of commentary, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, know, I'm a big uh, fan of commentary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, who's not? Um, well, actually quite a few people. Yeah, quite, like, I would say more, <laughs> more, 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 there's more of them than us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, um, <laughs> who's not, you know, I, it, especially I, now that I, pod I, is back on Twitter. I mean, my God, I know dear yeah. God. I mean, um, I, I, I worry that an intervention is coming, no, but, um, <laughs> The, um, uh, you know, I, I had this long, I don't want to get into the weeds on it, but I had this long riff about when the GOP started to go Trumpy. Like I, I felt like the, the security guard at a bank who made a decent living for years doing nothing because nothing was asked of them. And then when the moment came that something was asking them, you feel like, okay, you got to try and stop the robbery, right? And like commentary, and really to a certain extent, John Pedort's exists for the moments like post-October 7 to defend Israel, to get its back, to marshal arguments and voices and all that kind of stuff. So I, where there are times where the commentary podcasts crushing morosity, I find to be uh, worthy of debate and criticism. On this, like they're going to have they, they have an obligation to their people, to their mission. You know, this is what commentary is for, is to defend Jewish life and and Israel and and Jewish related you know concerns. Um, and this is the biggest threat I've seen to any of that in my lifetime. I mean, there have been wars that have been threatening to Israel, but I just saw a poll today that says one out of five Democrats support Hamas. Yeah. And. I have a very hard time containing my um, remaining poised um, amidst some of this stuff. It'd be one thing if people were f flipping out at Israel and attacking Jews in America because Jews started it, right? That they did something bad that outraged people. But the outrage really does seem to be that Jews objected to Jews being slaughtered. And... I don't know how some are, some positions can't be argued with to a certain extent because they're just so evil and wrong um, and so based in irrationality. But I mean, we can talk about how the war is going. I think there are going to be ups and downs and all that. And I heard you talking to Pot about how it's so far it's knock on wood going better than you might think and all that. That's great. What about what is your why? Why, why do you think so many Americans have a Ira I mean, I'll just say it, irrational bigotry. You can call it anti-Semitic if you want, but an irrational bigotry towards Israel. And I mean, and forget the spillover about Jewish, you know, Jews in America and anti-Semitism. What, what is it about Israel that do you think offends, that gets at the heart of why it just enrages so many people? You know, I was on Saturday night, I was at a, an event with um, Leo Raz, who's the, who's the star of and creator of, a co-creator of Fauda, who, who was in town. Um, Netflix show Net about uh, Israeli intelligence yeah, stuff. Yeah, Israeli kind of yeah, an, undercover. Unit. A twenty-four in Israel kind yeah, of thing. There you go. Uh, and he was in town raising money for um, uh, this project uh, that's helping with a lot of the the relief work in Israel. It's a very, very impressive uh, work that all the it's volunteer organization. So I was at I was at this evening thing with dinner with all these Israelis, both Israelis that had come to town to raise money, and then also Israeli Amer Israelis who live here in New York. I think I was the only non-Israeli uh, there, and um, and I was talking to them, and I was trying to you know comfort them, and 
and uh, talk to them and, you know, express support and compare notes. And at, at some point, like more than one of them, like three or four of them said to me at different times, I said, hey, listen, don't worry. We'll be okay. I mean, this is hell. This is hell. But we'll be okay. We know what to do. We know how to come together. We know how to fight. We know how to, you know, we've dealt with threats uh, to varying degrees of uh, existential threats throughout our throughout our um, history. We'll be fine. But what about you guys? What about the U.S.? The, the Israelis are watching this and saying, "You people have lost your minds." Exactly what you're describing. I mean. The 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 equivalent of the Saturday Night Live. I just posted this on Twitter. The Saturday Night Live, or I did a couple of days ago. Uh, the U.S. Israel's version of Saturday Night Live has, has now created segments of sketches in English, which they never do. Like they they have this, you know, like these these like um, pro queer, you know, uh, queer in Palestine, pro queer Palestine group on on the Columbia University campus. They like do a sketch like mocking yeah, them. Yeah, no, I've watched it. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah. Or they do a, a mock a, a riff on a BBC segment. I mean, they're watching all this and they're like, "This is crazy! What's happening in your yeah. country?" So, what about your country? I I I'm stuck on this one. I'm. Um, I'm so shocked by it. I, I, you know, I have children who go to Jewish day school. I, I, I mean, I just watch what goes through what ha- what's happening at this Jewish day school, which is on the one hand, they're so immersed in everything happening, which I think is great. And half the faculty is Israeli and they're completely immersed in this war and this crisis and the hostages and why it matters. And they you know, it's, that's wonderful. On the other hand, what's not wonderful is watching your kids go to school every morning and seeing NYPD cars out front and like, all the security presence and every day now. And so it's, it's like, I feel vulnerable in a way that I've never felt before. And, um, I, I always know there's blowback, usually rhetorical blowback against Israel, but usually that blowback isn't like mobs of people killing American Jews, literally. Like it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's so jarring. So I don't know how to explain that other than to just throw your hands up and say it's the oldest hatred and it's been around. And if you go on Google and type in any century and the word anti-Semitism, you'll see horrific anti-Semitic events in any century going back as long as we can remember. And so why should it be any different now? I mean, that's you could just say it's just the same old thing. Um, what, And that may be true. Or, or you could say, look, most of the people who are echoing this stuff don't really know what they're talking about. It's not really anti-Semitism. It's, it's, it, we see more of it because of social media and, and it's, it's has like a circuitous effect because it's, we see more because of social media of it. And then all that social media content fuels, you know, more of the anti-Semitism because it's like bad information informing people, misinforming people. So do I really think all these kids who are getting sucked into this stuff are actually anti-Semitic or have they bought in, is it just a symptom Have they bought into this whole intersectional structure that they've been raised to believe that the world is divided between the powerful and the powerless and Israel's the powerful and you know and that and that we just need to educate them about how Israel's not the powerful it's here the sort of the powerless and you know Yossi Klein Halevi who I a scholar in Israel who I had on my podcast explained that that's the whole phenomenon of the tearing down of the posters. This is like a thing now is people are going around tearing down these posters of the children hostages. Why do they have to, why is that a thing? Why are people tearing down the posters? Because the posters give lie to the idea that the Jews are the all powerful, right? If you have children being held hostage, those children are clearly powerless and it's like cognitive dissonance. You have to tear it down. You can't have those images. So these these ignoramuses are just lost in this notion that Israel's the all powerful, Israel's the colonialist, Israel's and 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 what we have to do is just explain that's not true. We have to explain it's not about Israel versus Palestinians. It's about Israel versus Hamas and Israel versus Hezbollah, two genocidal organizations that are on the north and the south and north of you know Israel's borders, respectively. Increasingly radicalized elements in the West Bank. That could be a third front. Obviously, Iran which has talked about wiping Israel, that, that Israel's up against all of that. So some Palestinian fight that Israel's in the middle of, that's just a proxy of a larger fight. And in that sense, Israel's the powerless. We could try to explain that. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that'll work because I don't, 
I'm jarred by this whole, I mean, this is a little there. This is kind of like therapeutic for me because I haven't really talked about it like this. Like everyone's coming to me. A lot of people are coming to me like friends and colleagues. What do we do? What do we do? We need a plan. This is outrageous. All these kids, all these parents want to pull their kids out of their elite colleges. Every third building, every third lecture hall and dining hall on elite American college campuses has a Jewish name on it because the building was named after the donor. And all these Jewish donors are like, look, we weren't expecting any special influence when we made this donation. We just assumed that there wouldn't be pogroms here. That's like that was like our baseline. Our baseline was like not pogroms, you know. Um, And so all these community leaders are like talking to people like me and Pod and others who are, you know, out there saying, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? I will tell you, Jonah, like. I don't really have a good answer right now because this is so. I could say we need to explain it better and we need to. I'll say one thing. And this is something that not a lot of Jews are going to want to hear. The one thing I do know is I think American Jews, many American Jews have chosen to lead, lead very secular, very assimilated lives with a sliver of Jewish identity, but that's about it. And not insisting that their children have real Jewish literacy and real Jewish identity and being part of, you know, rituals and community and then these kids wind up on these elite college campuses and then they see this outburst of anti-Semitism. And many of these, Jew- these Jewish kids' in- instinct is to just keep their heads down. Like, what do I need this for? And and the parents are outraged because they're more like from the immediate post-Holocaust generation. They're like, how could you not be out? You know, how could you not be doing? How come you're not protesting? And you can't raise these kids with very little Jewish connection and then hope when things get really hot that they're going to be like team Jew. Like I'm all in. Many of kids are like, but mom, dad, this was, this never mattered to you when I was younger. You never taught me anything. You didn't teach me, send me to school. You didn't send me to camps. You didn't, we didn't have regular Shabbat dinners. You know, we didn't have any, we didn't have any of this. And now because there's pogroms, it suddenly matters. So the one thing I would say is to my Jewish friends, raise Jewish kids. Like that, that's the one thing we know that works. It, you know, I mean, in terms of keeping the community alive and getting some continuity, but, and they're the ones on yeah, the I front mean, lines look, I, right I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I, and you might as well be lecturing me directly. No, no, totally I'm not. Fair. I'm not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not taking offense at all. I mean, I'm really not. I mean, I, I but my point is, is like. You went to Road of Shalom, things, by the way. I went to Road of Shalom Day School. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Road of Shalom Day, Day School was the most, was the first reform yeah. Day school, reform Jewish day school in the country where parents set their kids to be raised Jewish, but not too Jewish. Right. And um <laughs> Jew and uh, Jewish. Ish, yeah. I mean, <laughs> maybe not maybe not Santos level Jewish, but you know, right, um right. but I was bar mitzvah and all that kind of stuff. And um uh and I would say one of the things that ties me most deeply to to Judaism is my guilt over being a bad Jew. Um, that is a, <laughs> I have a very deep abiding Jewish guilt about my bad Jewishness. And, yeah. um, um, and so I hear you, the, my only objection to the point, which I'm sure you agree with and weren't trying to sound like it is like when we're trying to explain why all these people can't stand the Jews or why they, uh, or can't stand Israel to turn it to, well, Jews need to do a better job of raising Jews is to make it it, it, it. it feels a little bit like putting this burden back in the lap of Jews for the hatred that other people. It's like it's it's a little bit like a blame Israel for Hamas killing their babies. I get it, but, but how do I? How do I? I mean, this is now turning into real therapy. But I sit here because because I'm spending a lot of time <laughs> thinking about this. Like, I'm watching what happened. It's going on at Harvard, which is insane. I went, you know, I'm a, I went, I mean, I, a, a kid was basically like beaten up by a pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protest mob on the Harvard Business School campus in front of the Klarman Hall, right, which is named after Seth mm-hmm. Klarman, who made one of the biggest, if not the biggest donation to Harvard Business School on that on that grass area in front of the Klarman Hall. A Jewish kid was literally like a, it was like assaulted uh, by a group of Harvard students from Harvard Law School, from Har- like, 
how do I even have this conversation with Harvard? Like, what, what do I say? Like, it's so obviously insane what's going on. Right. That, like, no, I what, agree with that. What's the intellectual, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I'm stuck because it's, it's so obvious to me. And I, um, uh, you know, that, that's what's where I sympathize with these Israelis who say to me, we're going to be fine. Yeah, we're in the middle of a war, an existential right. war, but we'll be OK. You right. guys, but we have our act together, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. no, I, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, so I, just because I struggle with this too, you know, I'm a, I love intellectual history. I love having arguments about intellectual history and all this kind of stuff. But one of the things that I sort of have been obsessed with in the last few years, not in the context of Israel, but in the context of all sorts of other things, but now I'm thinking about it in terms of Israel, is we often get the causality backwards, and so we'll we think about. Um, here's an idea and here are the consequences that flow from the idea. When in reality, what often happens is here's a desire. Let's create an idea and then say the idea justifies the actions. And so one example is um, uh, the fight against fossil fuels or against oil, right? Everybody, you ask anybody today, why, why do we have to get rid of uh, dependence on oil? And they'll say climate change. But if you actually look at the history of opposition to oil by environmentalists, it begins when we were still worried about global cooling. It begins with the Santa Barbara oil spill before the argument about climate change. And back then it was more like, well, petroleum is basically the lifeblood of capitalism and capitalism is bad and therefore we got to get rid of it. And so the climate change argument is a in some way, I'm not saying climate change is wrong or fake or any of that kind of stuff. I'm just saying it's, in some ways, it's pretextual to the anti-oil thing. Similarly, this settler colonialism stuff, I did a deep dive on this recently. And well, yeah, look, I mean, you can go back to Franz Fanon and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the sort of modern obsession with settler colonialism is really a construct of like the 90s. And um, people hate, you can look it up. There were people who hated Israel prior to the 1990s. <laughs> and so in some ways, I think a lot of the settler colonialism stuff, particularly how selectively it's applied. I mean, I've yet to hear a single person who's outraged, truly outraged by settler colonialism, say boo about China's erasure of Tibet or Mongolia or Russia's invasion of Ukraine or or its liquidation of Chechnya. You know, I mean, like there it is. I mean, Russia, the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union were settler colonists on an epic scale for centuries. And no one gives a rat's ass, but they all think that Israel, because it's taking 100 yards in one direction or another, needs to be wiped off the map as a settler colonialist. And so in many ways, I think the settler colonial argument, which a lot of our crowd wants to argue with, kind of misses the point, because I think that intellectual project was created to justify hating Israel. It doesn't. It, it's it's it gets the the cart and the horse are in the other order and and I think this is something that's sort of missing in a lot of the intellectual debate is like a lot of these intellectual projects that come out of critical race theory and all these kinds of things these are projects to create to to blend new credibility to the old agenda right so they're right? backing into it they're like backing yeah. into it right right they've come up with a new riff to 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 kind of back into an old an old debate. I mean, after the end of the Cold War, you couldn't use Cold War arguments about Israel. So lo and behold, in the mid-90s, they start coming up with this argument about settler colonialism. Right. Um, and, and I think that's uh, – and so that – I'm not, again, I'm not saying that all anti-Zionists are anti-Semitic. But at this point, at the point of what the Marxists will call praxis, right, where the, the, where the theory and the reality meet in action, the vast majority of the anti-Zionists – have no problem with anti-Semitic arguments or having anti real anti-Semites in their popular front coalition. And I, I, I don't know how you deal with that, you know? I mean, that's terrifying if that's true. Um, if they, if they do not view that as, as both reprehensible morally and as a massive political liability. I mean, that's, you know, if they if they, if they think neither are a concern, I would hope they think it's morally reprehensible, but if they don't, I hope, they at least think it's a political liability. <laughs> One would like to think. I mean, like I, I keep thinking about the, there was this woman from CAA, the yeah. talent agency in Hollywood, yeah. right? Who had some anti-Israel posts on Instagram or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. Again, I, I, 
as an intellectual matter, I'll disagree, but I can forgive people for disliking Israel, you know, particularly if they have ethnic ties to like yeah. Palestinians or whatever. I get it. That's fine. But you would like to think that a Hollywood super agent would be s- cynical enough right, totally. to realize that crapping on Israel from a great height on October 7 or r- immediately afterwards in Hollywood would be a bad idea career wise, you know, it's just like have some common sense. And like there's the, the that part that's missing is really fascinating. To me and that's the same thing at the universities, right? These universities right. have raised this. You walk around the University of Pennsylvania, literally every single building is the Lauder building, the ha- Josh Harris building, the Mark Rowan, this, that every building is prominent American Jews. Uh, and uh, and you'd think. To your point, they'd be cynical enough, the administrators in the de- development office, to say, ooh, probably don't want to alienate all these people. So that's – they're clearly balancing a bunch of equities. Uh, by the way, and I know I, you just hit on something, and I just don't – I want to make sure I mention before we before we wrap it. You just alluded to it. I don't agree with many of the voices within the Palestinian community or the, the Arab community who are making these insane criticisms of Israel both here and abroad. But I can at least deal with them. Like I can like argue with them. And I'm not saying I know where they're coming from, but I I think many of them, not all, come by the, their positions honestly. What is so weird to me is all these people who know nothing, who have no connection to it. They're just some 19 or 20-year-old kid who's studying like candle making, you know, in some some ridiculous faux academic program at an elite institution who's has no connection to the Arab or Islamic world or the Palestinian experience has suddenly made this their cause that I find like that's the stuff that makes me crazy. And they're the ones chanting from the river to the sea. Yeah. Uh, And just to bring it back to the beginning, I know you got to go, but I think in some ways the kids, a lot of the kids who are doing that are just because they lack the sense of meaning and belonging and mission focus that you get from living in a healthy, serious community with a healthy family. And so they're looking for it on the cheap with these perverted and distorted sort of belonging by proxy. I mean, there's no other way to explain queers for Palestine, except that these people crave a certain amount of belonging to some cause larger than themselves. And they've latched on to a really perverted and, and, and irrational one, but it's, it, fill, it feels like it fills up some of the holes in their soul. I mean, that's that's part of my explanation for and it. And my only hope for that, my only my sliver of optimism is it's all so superficial. They, they, you know, they, they kind of dash in and out of these causes. And as much as they latched onto them as quickly as they did, there could be a wake-up moment in this country where some subset of them or a majority of them just move on to something else. So they won't be cheering on Jew hunting for long. That's my hope. But maybe I'm being a uh, incredibly naive. On that optimistic note, yeah, it's great. <laughs> what to say? You got to run to we, the commentary we, podcast. You know, we gotta, we, we, well, why? We, you know, let's let's like end on a on a on a dark note. Why why um, why why run, I end on a happy note? Yeah, it's very. Yeah, this is a very I mean, Jewish conversation, mostly because I, sure. I actually didn't have answers to a lot of your questions. I just wanted to fetch. Yeah, no, look, I get it. I totally get it. Um, and, you know, the remnant is partly about for kvetching. Yeah. So, uh, Dan Senor, the book is The Genius of Israel. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. And you, you should come back sometime. I'd love to do it. I, I, I love this podcast. I listen to it religiously, no pun intended, given I, I mean that not the way we're talking about like biblical proportions. And uh-huh. uh, and I, I also do, if I can cast a vote, I do like the solo remnant Saturday mornings. Uh, uh, okay. just monologues or whatever they are they're their own yeah, veg just, sessions and so don't so don't give them up you're dead to my wife now but okay so i'm just saying i'm just telling uh, her <laughs> i mean i know her and I, if you want me to talk I to know, her I, I i enjoy them i find them weirdly relaxing and um and and they're like it's just it's, i just imagine you staring at a computer screen and yelling for like an hour and i just that's that's you 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 Pretty much described exactly how it works. I mean, we actually record video of it. We just don't use it because it's just don't, too don't, creepy. Don't, don't, yeah, 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 don't, 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 creepy. don't, don't. No, no, no. That that would be, you know, but so keep it up. All right. Thanks Dan for Cino, having me, Thank Jonah. you so much. All right.